leverage the text as the authority. This is what God says, even though ultimately the authority is based on the agreement between the people. This video is for educational purposes only. The first point I want to note is this. All right, let's see it. The logic behind this is that you can negotiate spiritual laws and authority if enough people want to. So the point is not that you can negotiate these things. The point is that every last person who has ever lived has absolutely no choice but to negotiate these things because it is physically impossible to demonstrate that they exist outside of discourse, which means they are created and curated by that discourse which means agreement is what determines meaning and authority. Now there is disagreement, so the discourse can be subdivided and they can break off into different groups in order to engage in their own curation of these agreements, but none of it exists outside of agreement. If I wanted to climb to the top of that tree right there and I wanted to jump off and I wanted to float, hey, Mr. Sir, would you sign this petition that if enough of us get together and we stand on top of that tree and jump off, we'll float. You really think that's gonna happen? It's not, it's not logical. You can't change laws of physics. So this is an absolutely ludicrous straw man. At no point did I state that the laws of physics have no inherent meaning or authority. It was that the meaning and the authority of the Bible is not inherent, but can only be agreed upon. The laws of physics are based on observation and experimentation within the world around us and outside of our discourse. It can be demonstrated through experimentation that these things hold beyond our discourse. No such demonstration is possible for the meaning or the authority of the Bible. And laws of physics originated from God himself, which are linked with the law of sin and death. So this is a claim that cannot possibly be demonstrated. It's a claim that can only be agreed upon. Let's take getting drunk, for example. The Bible says that's a sin. So there's not a single syllable of the Bible that actually identifies getting drunk explicitly as sin. We have one passage in Ephesians that says don't get drunk on wine because that leads to asotia, to dissipation, to profligacy. But that's nowhere identified explicitly as a sin. That word only occurs three times in the New Testament. Now, someone can make the case, well, this is that and that is sin. Or, well, sin includes anything that does this, that, or the other. And that's making a case. That's not empirically demonstrating. That requires people agree with the case you make. Again, it requires a consensus view. And I could point out that this same author elsewhere says that it doesn't matter what you eat or drink. None of that is sinful. And so uh, that could undermine that case. I could also point out that this same author elsewhere says uh, men need to possess their vessels, have sex with their wives, in holiness and in honor and not passionately that's for the Gentiles who don't know God. And so if Paul saying don't do X means X is a sin, then having passionate sex with your wife is a sin, at least if Paul is any authority on this. But I have a feeling that you wouldn't agree with that. There's no way for either of us to empirically demonstrate that any of those things are sin. It just requires enough of us agree on it. If we get enough people to sign a petition, to say we don't want getting drunk to be a sin anymore, and then you go on each day living life getting drunk, that little petition's not going to stop all the physical damage that it's going to do to your body. So this is another absolutely ludicrous straw man. The observation that the Bible has no inherent meaning or authority does not mean that negotiating the meaning or authority of the Bible negotiates reality, nor does it mean that there is nothing in the Bible that overlaps with reality. In order for this argument to make any sense, you must be claiming that the deleterious health effects of habitual drunkenness are a direct product of the authority of the Bible. Bible. And that's absolutely laughable. Uh, those deleterious health effects existed long before the Bible and exist well beyond the reach of the Bible. The Bible actually nowhere says that habitual drunkenness leads to damage to your health. It only ever talks about the deleterious spiritual and social effects of constant drunkenness. Additionally, we can point to texts like the Quran and the Book of Mormon and the Bhagavad Gita and other texts that make observations that align with physical reality. That does not suddenly endow them with the same degree of authority as the Bible. This is a phenomenally tortured, fallacious argument. 
You guys really have to think through what you say. A sin's not just a sin because people want to call it a sin. It's a sin because of the eternal and natural effects that it can have on you. Yes, a sin is absolutely only a sin because enough people have agreed to label it a sin. Uh, and the fact that there is overlap between some of the things that are labeled sinful and things that we can demonstrate have deleterious social, emotional, and physical effects is not a demonstration that there's anything inspired or authoritative or meaningful about that label. We can also point to things that have been labeled sinful that cannot be shown to have any deleterious social, emotional, or physical effects in and of themselves. Things like homosexuality, for instance, have no deleterious social, emotional, or physical effects in and of themselves, which is why people have to gin up these tortured arguments for how it actually is harmful socially or emotionally or physically. But those arguments always fall to pieces because they are entirely based on the need to generate an argument for what is ultimately rooted in an agreement. But continue. So why uh, the earliest Christians believed that eating blood and charging interest were sinful. Eating blood is sinful. The Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. In the Hebrew, that translates into nephesh, which means soul. A dimension of the human soul is located in the blood of that human. So if you go trying to eat the blood of that human, it's going to raise issues, spiritual issues. So I was very clearly not talking about eating human blood. And the early Christian belief that eating blood was a sin was also not about eating human blood. God was against charging interest because he didn't want to put people in an even worse boat than they were already in because, you know, he's a merciful God. So if God was against charging interest because God was merciful, then what changed? Uh, there is not a syllable of the Bible that describes polygamy or slavery as sinful. Number one on polygamy. Polygamy is sinful. God's original order was for a man to have one wife and a wife to have one husband. So there is no such order anywhere in the Bible. Genesis 2.24 is not prescriptive. It's just an etiology for independent kinship units. And it was never interpreted by early Israelite, Judahite, or Jewish, or even early Christian groups until enough people agreed that they didn't like polygamy. And that was a passage that they then agreed meant that we shouldn't have polygamy. So that's a renegotiated meaning. Old Testament God was lenient. New Testament Paul reestablishes this. So does Jesus. One husband, one wife. That's not established anywhere in the New Testament. And again, when Genesis 2.24 is being quoted, no one ever understood it as a prescriptive prohibition of polygamy until centuries later when enough people agreed that polygamy was wrong. As for slavery, don't take scripture out of context. The transatlantic was sinful and goes against scripture because it displayed hate for humanity, which breaks the law of loving your neighbor, acting with malicious intent, sexual immorality, and others. It only breaks those laws to the degree that people agree it breaks those laws, which was why it flourished for so very long and why people appealed directly to the Bible as a defense of slavery. Slavery in biblical day is more comparable to the employer-employee structure that we have with work today. Nice try, though. So this is an absolutely laughable falsehood. Even if we were to pretend that the Bible only endorses debt servitude, which is not true, that debt servitude was absolutely nothing like the employer-employee relationship today. For instance, uh, a man could take on a debt servant and then give him a wife and breed more slaves for himself. And when that debt servant was set free, in the seventh year, the wife and the children stayed with the master. They were his slaves. But beyond that, the Bible explicitly endorses chattel slavery. In Leviticus 25, verses 44 through 46, it explicitly says, you will get your slaves from the nations around you, buy, sell, pass down as inheritance because they are ahuza, they are possessions, they are property. The Bible's concept of slavery is absolutely nothing like contemporary notions of employee-employer relationships. That's absolutely laughable. Don't take scripture out of context because we know what it says. No, you and others have agreed upon what it says.